I'm Bob Duhamel, and today we are going to take a closer look at resistors. We've already taken a look at resistors and resistors and circuits, but let's take a quick review just to refresh our memory. So a resistor acts like a pinch in a hose or a pipe or something. So I have a soda straw here, and if I blow through it, the air flows through fairly freely. If it was a bigger straw, it would flow through more freely, but it flows through fairly freely anyway. But if I pinch it, the tighter I pinch it, the harder it is to blow air through. And that's how a resistor acts in a circuit or in a wire. A resistor acts as if it's a pinch in that wire. So all wire has resistance, but a resistor is a device that puts a specific amount of resistance in a specific place in a circuit. So once again, it's like pinching this a soda straw. So when I blow through it, what happens? I get a backup of pressure where the conventional current goes in and a drop in pressure where it comes out. So when I have resistance here in the air, there's no difference in the pressure from one side to the other. And if I open it up and blow through, there's essentially no difference. There's a little bit of it because this does resist the flow of air a little bit, but it's not very much difference. But when I pinch it down, I get a huge pressure difference between where the conventional current hits the resistance and on the other side. So a resistor reduces the flow of electricity in a circuit. That's one job of a resistor, but another job is to give a controlled difference in voltage. So whenever we have current flowing through a resistor, we get a voltage difference from one side of that resistor to the other. We get a higher voltage where the conventional current enters the resistance and a lower voltage where it exits. So once again, a resistor controls the flow of electricity, but also gives us a controlled voltage differential at the point of that resistance. And we only have that voltage differential if we have both resistance and current. If we have resistance by itself, there's no difference from one side to the other. So for example, let's say I have a battery, a 10 volt battery, and that goes to a 10 ohm resistor. And let's put the black lead of our voltmeter right here, making that our ground. We're measuring all of our voltages from that point. So this is our zero volts here. And let's put the red lead of our voltmeter right here. What voltage are we going to measure? Well, we're going to measure the difference in voltage across this battery, which is 10 volts. So we'll read plus 10 volts. Now the circuit is open, so there's no current flowing through it. How much voltage do I lose across this resistor? What's the voltage difference between here and here? There is none because I have a resistance, but I have no current because the circuit is broken. So resistance, no current, voltage difference is zero, no difference. So I start with 10 volts. I still have 10 volts. But now let's say we put some circuitry out here. We don't know what it is. But that circuitry causes, let's say, a tenth of an amp of, re of current to flow through that resistor, 100 milliamps. Now what's going to happen? Well, now I have 10 volts here, but because I now have current flowing through that resistor, I'm going to have a voltage difference across it, do a little Ohm's law, and we find that we've lost one volt, so I'm going to have plus nine volts over here. So I have a one volt difference. I start with 10 volts, I lose one volt, and so I have plus nine volts left over. So what I have is, if I put my voltmeter directly across this resistor, I'm going to measure one volt. So that's how a resistor acts on its own. We've also looked at multiple resistors and circuits and seen how voltages add up in a series circuit and how in a parallel circuit it's the currents that add up. If you want to review that, be sure to go back to those videos on parallel and series circuits. But now let's start looking at resistors themselves and how they're made and how we use them. So one type of resistor we don't see that much anymore is a carbon composition resistor. It's just a block of carbon with a couple of leads connected to it. And they're not very accurate, which is one reason we don't see them too often. So uh, they have a fairly low tolerance. 
much more common type of resistor we see today is what's called a thin film resistor. It starts out as a substrate of a ceramic material and then a thin layer of metal is deposited on it and that metal is etched away in a spiral pattern so that we have a spiral of metal of a thin metal around a ceramic substrate to put a couple of caps on the ends to uh, connect up to it and then the whole thing is coated with epoxy so a metal composition or so yeah metal a thin metal resistor usually has a shape that looks sort of like this a little bit of a slight dog bone shape to it because of the two metal caps on the end and being dipped into epoxy another type of resistor that's fairly common for high power resistors is a wire wound resistor so a wire with a certain known resistance per inch is wound around a ceramic substrate and usually then encased in either a piece of ceramic or sometimes inside a piece of aluminum to or aluminum housing to act as a uh, uh, to collect the heat from it and dissipate the heat into the atmosphere so those are your most common types of resistors that you'll see another type of resistor that's uh, commonly used as a variable resistor and these are made in two typical ways one way is a carbon track resistor so there's a piece of carbon it's made usually in a circular track sometimes they're in a straight line for what are called uh, linear potentiometers not to be confused with linear taper we'll talk about that in a moment but anyway there's a wiper that is connected to a handle of some sort a knob and that can be taken across to where we have a connection on this end a connection on that end and another connection to the middle and we have a carbon track uh, variable resistor so we have a certain amount of resistance let's say this one's uh, 10k so it'll be labeled by how much resistance we have from one end to the other and then this wiper can be put anywhere to get a different amount of resistance so if we put it in the middle like here we're going to have about 5k and 5k assuming this is a linear taper uh, type of uh, potentiometer if this is a logarithmic taper also called an audio taper it will have a track such that we have a greater resistance on one end and it becomes less and less as we go to the other end in a logarithmic pattern so that for example let's say we move the wiper uh, from here to here let's say it's a 10k uh, logarithmic taper pot and let's say we move it a quarter turn well let's say that took us 5k but we move it to another quarter turn and that's 2.5k another quarter turn is 1.5k so we get a gradient of less and less resistance as we go across so that we get that logarithmic uh, change in voltage which works very well for audio circuits which is what why they call it an audio taper sometimes because it's uh, it sounds good to our ears which tend to hear on a logarithmic uh, uh, scale so if it's a linear taper we put that in the middle we get 5k and 5k if it's a logarithmic taper it'll be a little different but as we move that wire wiper we get more and more resistance on one side and less and less on the other as you can see as we move away from that end we're going to get more resistance between these two connections and less resistance between these two and vice versa so that's your typical potentiometer another type of potentiometer is made uh, such that we have a ceramic substrate with a wire wound around it and these are usually used for high power potentiometers and in this case they're often called a rheostat so rheostat may be used to mean any variable resistor but it may but it's more specifically used to mean these heavy wire wound variable resistors and when we have types of variable resistors we have like the big rheostats we also have smaller uh, variable resistors for general purpose another type of variable resistor is a trim pot which is a very tiny version of it and from for trim pots we have two styles one is a multi-turn and one is a single turn so this would be a single turn potentiometer here we make a arc with it it only goes one time but multi-turn potentiometers have some kind of a mechanism uh, the ones I know of most commonly have a linear track and if we look at this on the side there is a what's called a lead screw 
and there's a follower on that with our connection connecting to our carbon track. And so there is going to be a knob or a screw on the end of it. As we turn that, it moves the lead screw. So if we get this guy out of the way here, we have a connection on this end and a connection to that end and a connection to the follower. And as the follower goes along the lead screw, we get a change in resistance from one side to the other or between these two and these two leads. And once again, these might be a linear taper or a, a logarithmic taper, depending on the need. But uh, your trim pots tend to be a logarithmic, excuse me, a linear taper. So we have the little tiny ones that use the screw. We also have multi-turn pots that can have knobs. We have uh, also multi-turn pots that are square, with a little screw coming out this side, and that would be a would have a wiper on a uh, gear that goes around through the middle. So it has a one-turn type of thing that we turn the screw, and so that goes to a little worm, and that worm goes to a worm gear, and that turns the little track, or the little wiper along the track. So as we turn this knob, turns the turns the worm, engages the worm gear, and that rotates the uh, wiper along the track. So we have two types of uh, trim pots that have the multiple turn type of uh, mechanism. The square ones that use this mechanism and the uh, long ones that use the, uh, the lead screw type of mechanism. So that's your basic uh, construction of your potentiometers. Uh, here's our our uh, symbols that we use for potentiometers. First of all, what you'll see frequently is, let me redraw this, a variable resistor. I'm used to using the zigzag type of resistor uh, symbol. In Europe, the square is more popular, or should I say the rectangle. And if we put a arrow through this, that means it's a variable resistor. All variable resistors are actually potentiometers. So what we really have is a device that has a Let's look at our track again. Connection at each end, and then a connection to the wiper. And so they're all really potentiometers, but if we only hook up to two leads, that becomes a variable resistor. Now, actually, to make a variable resistor, we're going to make that with a potentiometer. Let's make the symbol for a potentiometer. There's the typical American symbol. European, pretty much the same thing, just we like the zigzag here in the States. And this represents the wiper that moves back and forth. So if we have a, a 10K potentiometer, if we measure between the two ends, we get 10,000 ohms. But if we measure between an end and the wiper, we get whatever the wiper is set at. So there's your potentiometer. And if we're going to make a variable resistor, we typically will tie that potentiometer to one side. The reason for this is, let's say we go straight to the wiper, connect here and connect here. Well, what if there's a fault and we get a part of the track here where it's been slightly burned or just a flaw in manufacturing where we get no connection between the wiper and the track? Well, then we have an open circuit there and that means this becomes an open circuit. And that may or may not be a bad thing, but some circuits don't like to have an open circuit there. And so what we do is actually connect this over to here. And this makes our variable resistance. And so if we get a bad connection here, we still have that 10K. So we never have greater than 10K of resistance, if, even if this uh, makes, breaks contact for a, a moment. So a variable resistor is typically made with a potentiometer with one side tied to the wiper. It doesn't matter which side. It just That just determines which way you turn the pot to get the uh, change in resistance. So we have a variable resistor, which is really a potentiometer. where variable resistor, potentiometer, and here is a real-world variable resistor. Getting a little sloppy with my drawing here, but you get the point. European version, American version. And so variable resistor, 
potentiometer. Remember the potentiometer has a connection to each end of the resistance element and then one connection to the wiper. So that represents one end, that represents the other end, this represents the wiper. And to make a variable resistor, we usually make that with a potentiometer wired as I have it here. Whenever you have current flowing through a resistance, you get power dissipation. We get heat coming from that resistor. And how do we get rid of that heat? Well, the only way to get rid of that heat is by transferring it to the atmosphere. And the more surface area we have, the more heat we can transfer. And so if we want a resistor that can handle more heat, we simply have to make it bigger so we have more surface area. And for higher power re resistors, we might even put some aluminum housing around it with some fins on that to get more contact with the air and even maybe blow a fan across it if we need to get rid of a lot of heat. So small resistors can get rid of a little bit of heat. Bigger resistors can get rid of even more heat. And really, really big resistors might be built with, I don't know if I can draw it this way, with aluminum fins. Terrible drawing, but some aluminum fins to help get rid of the heat. So bigger resistors can handle more heat. A uh, resistor that's maybe uh, a little less than, a uh, little more than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter usually typically handles about an eighth of a watt. Our next size up uh, usually about a little more than a, a little more than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter is usually about a quarter watt. But the bigger the resistor, the more heat it can handle. So if you, whenever you're uh, designing a circuit to use resistors, don't forget to measure how much, or don't forget to calculate how much. Uh, heat that's going to dissipate and make sure you get the appropriate sized resistor. Uh, as a matter of fact, one time I uh, bought a little device that was supposed to simulate surround sound with my stereo, hooked it up, and before very long I saw smoke coming out of it because whoever designed it didn't think about how much power might be put into that, and my modest amplifier put in too much and smoked my resistors, so I had to go, I have simply bought some bigger resistors and rebuilt it, but bigger resistors can handle more power than little resistors. So resistors, whenever you have current going through resistance, you're always going to get heat. The formula is your power equals your current squared times your resistance. And so the more current, you double your current, you quadruple your power. So make sure that you uh, properly design around the right resistors you need. And uh, remember, a bigger resistor uh, dissipates more heat than a smaller resistor. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.